Hello, welcome to Line by Line Bible Studies. My name is Paul Stringini. We're studying the book of Matthew. We're beginning that today. I wanted to do uh, more topical studies, but uh, I kind of need to dive into a book right now. We'll do topical studies. Uh, we'll interrupt Matthew to do some. It's a long book. It's going to take a while. Not too long, because at an hour a day, we should make good progress quite quickly. Um, hmm. of course, I need to, uh, gotta get my words up there. It doesn't want to recognize them. Oh, great. That's a problem. Hmm. There we go. Thank you, program, for cooperating. So there's Matthew chapter 1. And, okay, really? Okay. There's Matthew 1. Chapter 1. Um, well, let's just dive right into it. We'll discuss things as we go. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. Judas would be Judah. Uh, the, in the New Testament, frequently, there's like an alternative pronunciation of the um, people because it's translated from Greek. And what they did is they would transliterate the Greek very often. And the Greek was a transliteration of the Hebrew. But um, depending on the language... When you transliterate a name, you get varying results. Like, like in English, we say Jesus. In Spanish, they say Jesus. We say Jesus too. Uh, but we, you know, like nobody names their kid Jesus in in uh, any English country that English speaking country that I know. But they don't call Jesus something different in Spanish. They don't say. You know, to their neighbor, hello, Jesus, and then go to church and call him Jesus. They call him Jesus. So we have kind of a hang up against that name. So instead of things like Judah, you get Judas. And Judas begat Perez and Zerah of Thamar, the two brothers. The brother Perez of the, uh, um, was it the red thread, the scarlet thread that was tied around? The wrist. Like, uh, yeah, he, they were being born and he stuck his hand out. And they said, this one's first. And they tied a red, a scarlet thread around his wrist. And then it went back in. And then the other one came out first. The other, the other, so. But he was still considered firstborn, even though he wasn't born first. But he kind of. He had, you know, it's like a race. You, the first one over the finish line. I don't know if you have to completely cross the finish line. You just have to touch it. And Pharaoh begat Ezra. And Ezra begat Aram. And Aram begat Aminadab. And Aminadab begat Nasson. And Nasson begat Solomon. And Solomon begat Boaz of Rechab. I said Boaz instead of Booz because that's his name in... Um, the book of Ruth. And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. And Obed begat Jesse. And Jesse begat David the king. And David begat Solomon. What does beget mean anyways, right? It means, it's the verb that means to father. Is what it is. It is what a father does. Mothers give birth. Fathers beget. Because you can't give birth without a beget, unless you go into the test tubes and all that stuff. And even then, there's someone's got someone somewhere is begetting the baby, unless they, I guess, go in with a needle. Even then, you're just kind of being begotten until they start genetically engineering our children and creating, you know, bizarre designer babies. It's uh, not a good idea, I think, but you know. They haven't done it yet. 
Oh, but they will when they get a chance, you bet. If they can get around the ethics. Gotta... And Jesse begat David the king, etc., etc., etc. And David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. That's Bathsheba. David's adulterous affair and murder brought about Solomon. And David suffered many things because of that. And Solomon begat Reboam. Reboam. Or Reboam. There's like a syllable missing there. In Hebrew, it's Rehoboam. Begat Abiah, and Abiah begat Asa. And Asa begat Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, I prefer to say. And uh, and even all that, you know, Jehoshaphat. It's, it's, in Hebrew, it's something like Yehoshaphat or something like that. It's uh, There's no J's. The J's are almost all Y's. Like Judas, Yehoshaphat. Joseph had began Yoram and Joram. We got Ozias. That's a uh, Uzziah in the Old Testament. Uzziah and Uzziah begat Jotham and Jotham begat Ahaz and Ahaz begat Ezekiel. Uh, that would be Hezekiah. There's a big difference there. So. Hezekiah begat Manassas, or Manasseh. Manasseh begat Ammon, and Ammon begat Josiah, the last decent king. And most of the kings of Israel and Judah were not good kings, at least on, according to the estimation of the prophets. They led the children of Israel astray and ultimately to disaster. That is um, undisputable. And Josiah begat Jeconias, Jeconiah, and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Sal Salatiel. And they, these become, well, and Zerubbabel, who is known as Nehemiah, son of Sal Salatiel. And Zerubbabel, Zorobabel, means from, uh, I believe bo born in Babylon or out of Babylon, something like that. Born in Babel. And Zerubbabel begat Abiud, and Abiud begat Eliakim. And Eliakim begat Azor, and Azor begat Sadak, or Zadok in Hebrew, or at least in the Old Testament, I should say, of your King James Bible. And Zadok begat Akim, and Akim begat Eliud. And Eliab begat Eliezer, and Eliezer begat Methan, and Methan begat Jacob. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, which is called Christ. So, this genealogy traces the lineage of Joseph. And it is probably incomplete. Because if you look in the book of Luke, which traces a different genealogy, which is uh, supposed to be of, it says Joseph, but <clears throat> if you look at the context, it says as reckoned by law, which means because of marriage, um, <clears throat> even though it's a matrilineal line, it reckons it according to the father, as far as when it, when it talks about Jesus. Uh, if we do Luke, we'll eventually, we'll, we'll do Luke, I suppose. Not anytime soon, but that's a different genealogy. And you know what? You can make endless disputes about genealogy and things like that. We're not supposed to really give heed to it. I don't worry about the weirdness of genealogy sometimes. And I call it weirdness because there are weird things that go on. You gotta understand that certain names get changed or struck. Um, like if someone did something incredibly bad... In the Old Testament times, and even through the New, they would be just left out of genealogies. Just like in the book of Revelation, um, when it names the, the 12 tribes of Israel, there's like missing tribes. Uh, like, they, they usually did not, when they talk about the 12 tribes, they don't count Levi usually. But in, 
uh, the book of Revelation, they do count Levi. And instead of Ephraim and Manasseh, they just have Joseph. And Dan's gone. So, um, that's uh, significant. Uh, you know, th so, they, they didn't think of these genealogies as being um, sort of precise instruments of exact, uh, you know, I mean, like, it didn't mean, it didn't have, like, if you skip a grandfather and went from great-grandfather to grand, uh, to, to father, <laughs> sorry, uh, that would not be considered, like, what's the problem? They, they didn't understand or anticipate necessarily the attitude that later people would take towards these things and taking them as, like, wow, this is the lame name of every guy and all the time periods and all that. They would not have thought that that was an important part of what they were doing. They weren't going for accuracy. They were going for the, just tracing the line. Meaning, you know, you don't have, like, um, you don't have to have the name of every ancestor as long as you're going back through people who are related to each other. And he comes up with a genealogy that's elegant, and that was his purpose. So he says, so the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David to the carrying away to Babylon are 14 generations. From the carrying away of Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Now, what I find fascinating is the, the very evenness there. In Luke, there's not, not that at all. There's a lot more names. And that one may be a full genealogy for all I know. I don't know. And some people may take offense at my, you know, the way I run down genealogies, as far as that's what they think I'm doing. <clears throat> but I do find them fascinating in this one respect, and I've mentioned this on several times. You know, I don't think the earth was created in 404 BC, but they do say that Jesus was born in 4 BC. It's fascinating to think that he was born exactly 5,000 years according to the reckoning of, or did I say 5, I meant 4? Uh, exactly 4,000 years after uh, the, the at least according to the numbers reckoned in the Bible that is came out even like that that's kind of astonishing if you think about it it's not a record of um, geological history but it's a record of theological history and in that term in those terms Jesus came around at precisely exactly the right time according to a theological standpoint the chronologies I don't rely on to understand like how old the rocks are but I do rely on the Bible to understand that Jesus is the Son of God and that he is you know the the New Testament belongs at the end of the book it's not just a uh, something we we attended to it you know uh, something I, I heard the, the the an atheist once say um, I gotta fix this there we go that you should never trust someone who only has one book. But if you're a Christian, you don't have one book, the Bible. You have 66 books, the Bible. And, uh, and that's significant because the Bible was not written by one person. It was written by, like, dozens of people over thousands of years. And for it to come out just, just like that, you know, that's just how it works out. Is, uh... It's definitely, you gotta, you can't just, oh, well, no, there's something about that. Even though, it, you know, they get so distracted, like, the earth is 4,000 years old. It's like, Jesus came 4,000 years after Genesis 1. That's fascinating. Like, exactly 4,000 years, not just about 4,000 years, exactly. The timing of Jesus' birth is very important. I mean, Daniel, there's a reason when Jesus was born that they were expecting the Messiah. It's uh, funny, in, uh, I haven't seen it in years, but in the Monty Python movie, uh, The Life of Brian, you know, there's just people, Messiahs everywhere. As far as people claiming to be the Messiah, people they're supposing to be the Messiah, and that's kind of a running joke. But the thing is, it's not like people are always looking for a Messiah, though, in a sense they are. But in, the, in that time, they were in expectation that the Messiah would be born. Because Daniel had said, and I'm not going to be precise about it because it's not quoted here, but from the going forth, the commandment to restore and rebuild the temple, 
until the Messiah the Prince shall be so many weeks. And, then, and according to the interpretation of that, it has to, you convert the weeks to days to years. It's like 490 years, or something like that. I forget exactly how it's, uh, it's actually four, not 490 because it's like you take one week off and blah, blah, blah. And he appears at exactly the right time. Jesus Christ appeared in history at precisely the moment he was prophesied to. Right, here we go. I don't know if that was necessary. <coughs> All right, here we go. Just a little sip of coffee here. Uh, now, the birth of Jesus was on this wise. This is how it was. When his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Meaning he wanted to get a private divorce. He didn't want to, um, you know, for a, um, a young girl to show up pregnant who was espoused to somebody in the Jewish law, that was a very severe um, transgression. You know, there would be people who would be inclined to stone her. Uh, and so, you know, that's... He's just, but he did not want to see... So, you know, he didn't want to make her a public example. You could say, well, you know, why didn't he want justice to be served? Why didn't he want her to be punished? I mean, the law called for it. As it says in the prophets, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. The Lord delights in mercy. He prefers it over, you know, because... Like Jesus said of the woman taken in adultery, he said, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. <clears throat> so she was found a child of the Holy Ghost. You know, the, the, so he was conceived of the Holy Spirit, not of man. And people, of course, make fun of that. But, um,. God created the world. And so, once you believe in that, and you realize that there there's more reality, that, that what we perceive as being real is merely a reality which is encapsulated within a greater reality, that miracles are not breakings of the laws of nature, they are revelations of the true possibility of nature. You know, we're only able to explore a limited <clears throat> amount of reality with our senses. And we just, everything we can sense, we think is real. We don't have access to things that are not real. Like we might already be in multiple dimensions. I, I believe there are more dimensions than that. The three of space and one of time. Rea but we're not tapping into the fundamental nature of reality as far as the multidimensional nature of space. I mean, going beyond just the three dimensions of space into other dimensions. And it's hard for us to even really understand those things because we are constructed of and in and are part of this, uh, this, just this experience. The only thing we can really even <clears throat> know is real or true is that we are experiencing something right now. Everything else we take with some degree of faith. Oh, but we know this. We know um, gravity works. You know, every time, if something goes up, every time, look, it fell. I can do it again. I can do it again. Um, ad infinitum, ad nauseum, whatever. I can just keep doing it, and it's going to keep it falling. <clears throat> because it's repeatable. And it's consistent. And therefore we say, well, it's a law. 
No, we don't know that. All we know is that so far, every time someone's tried that, it's worked the same. So we believe with a high degree of certainty that it will continue to do so. But there's nothing to say that someday it'll just you won't just drop it, you know, like, and and uh, uh, you won't drop. It. I was gonna do like a little silly trick where I held it up, um, and it won't go down. Because so oh, it's ridiculous. It's like, well, you know, I understand your disbelief or the strength of your belief in the repeatability of the ex experience you've had. But um, it is not actually proof just because just to do something over and over again. It's evidence, surely. But anyways. Miracles are kind of the evidence that the world is bigger than we realize. That the reality we live in is bigger. And once you believe in God, the idea of God, of the creator of all things, that the world is bigger, you know, things like the virgin birth, never let anyone shame you on that. It's like, well, I believe in, in God, so anything is possible. And besides, it's not like... Uh, the idea of a, a woman who's never been with a man giving birth, well, you know, we have in vitro fertilization, so it's not like you couldn't do the same thing with a needle. She could be a virgin to the day of giving birth. Though, you know, there's nobody who's like trying to do that, but it's technically possible. It's not even, this miracle is not even that, uh, the hardest part is getting the Holy Spirit to come along. Not to have a woman who's never been with a man conceive. Alright. Bring it back. So he wanted to put her away. Though well, much worse could have been done to her. He was not a, you know, he was older. He was not a rash and angry type of person. They wanted, he didn't want to see her come to harm. Verse 20, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take thee unto thee Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So he had a dream, and the dream convinced him to take her unto him as his wife. <clears throat> it's funny because um, I guess it suddenly reminded me that I remember now the Catholics think she was a perpetual virgin. That he took her to wife and did not consummate the marriage. You know, I don't believe that. Because I believe his brothers are his brothers, not just his pals but you know that's uh whatever I, I, don't, I don't make a big stink about it mm. when i was young i did i used to be like they actually think you know it's like, I, I don't know i think that whole attitude is like getting uh just getting down on other people about what they think when it's not an essential doctrine i mean i i if they if someone starts like trying to browbeat me with that, which no one has ever done. You know what I mean? No one's ever... Well, has ever done that? Yeah, sort of. Maybe a relative might have kind of browbeat me with it. And so, if someone's coming at you like with something you don't agree with, you can tell them what you think. You don't have to go along with it. You can even give them strong arguments. But, uh, yeah. If they want to make a stink about it, I, especially if it's like they're trying to if it brings about division, you know, like say, like say someone's trying to bring that into uh, whatever a church situation, etc. Yeah. Did I read verse twenty-one? And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua, and it means. Uh, Yah's Savior. Yah is a short name of Yahweh, 
the name of God translated, transliterated, or um, sort of uh, to, to explain why Jehovah and Yahweh are different is kind of like, well, it's very simple. What they did is they took the vowels from the letter, from the, because the, the Jews are very concerned about people taking the Lord's name in vain. So they went to a, a, a lot of effort to conceal it textually. So you wouldn't just kind of come along and just um, lightly say God's name. And uh, even to this day, Orthodox Jews won't say God's name. A lot of them say Hashem, which means the name. And uh, and so they what they did is they replaced the vowels in Yahweh with the vowels for Lord, Adonai. So in the Old Testament, you get this Jehovah, because it Adonai, Jehovah. So you get these sort of supplanted vowels, and you get this new word. But Jehovah's fine. It's not at all anything he was ever called in ancient times, but men have called him that now, and it's the name they've given him. I don't have a real big problem with that any more than I do with the name Jesus. Some people are very hung up on his name is Yeshua. <clears throat> and like, yeah, well, in some countries, my name might be Paul or Paul or whatever. I don't. If if they come over here and call me Paul, Paul, like all my um, Polish relatives tended to call me Paul, Paul. They they just had a trouble saying it with an English, you know, accent. I'm not offended by that. It was kind of charming, you know. I'm, you know, so calling Jesus, Jesus, he knows you're talking to him. You know, Jesus is not, um, that, the idea that he would be offended, like, no, you pronounce it Yeshua. Yeah, just, I just, I've always found that, um, it's fine to call him Yeshua if you like the sound of that, you know, Yeshua, nothing wrong with that, but don't be all legalistic on me and say like, no, no, it's got to be pronounced in this particular way, it's um. Let's see, I gotta think. I gotta change my chair here. Maybe that's better. Yeah, that feels more comfortable, and I'm more upright here. But anyways, the pronunciation of the name is not as important as he shall save his people from their sins. He's going to be the savior who delivers them from their sins. And now. Uh, so often, of course, that is, we think of that in terms of he's going to shed his blood on the cross and uh, by his blood, our sins are cleansed by his suffering, his stripes, we are healed. And that's all exactly right. But he does even more than that. According to, you know, unto you, Christ has first appeared I want to have the exact phrase. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Whereas in Titus we recently studied, the grace of God which bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live righteously, soberly, and godly in this present world. In this present world. The grace of God is teaching us that in this world we ought to live righteously. He saves us from our sins through his sacrifice. And he also sends the Holy Spirit, which teaches us how we might walk, how we might separate ourselves from sins. He forgives all our sins, but he also does more for us than just like say, well, there you go. There is power in the Holy Spirit. There's power in the gospel to deliver from sin, the meaning you could leave it behind. We can take we, we can take you know crucify the old man with the affections and lusts, and put on the new man, which is created in Christ Jesus, in righteousness and godliness and holiness. You can turn your life around. That's something Jesus came to give us, not merely the sacrifice, which is so very essential. Because, you know, just because I turn my life around, whatever, pull myself up by my bootstraps, 
Why should God? Uh, why should God forgive me? What do I have to pay for what I've already done? And it's not a matter of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. But it's a matter of walking with the Holy Spirit and allowing Him to be your guide. To teach you. Sometimes God gives us an instantaneous deliverance from sin. You'll hear stories of people like, you know, they went and people laid their hands on them and they were instantly delivered from drugs or alcohol or uh, some other form of addiction, lust, pornography, whatever. But then sometimes things take a long time. Sometimes it takes, you know, patience to learn patience. You know, um, if you're trying to improve your patience, sometimes it's like working out. You have to be tried in that thing. The important thing is that as we are tried, that we um, are mindful like that this is meant to build us up. The life, the suffer, the things we suffer, the things we go through, the trials we endure, to have the mentality that by these things we should grow and not just let it happen to us as by happenstance, as if this is just some strange thing that's come along and you know as soon as it's over we're gonna just get back to business get back to the business of sinning but rather to take every experience and turn it into something profitable and the holy spirit in that is our guide and our helper let me keep that brief Let's just take a moment. If you like Line by Line Bible Studies, subscribe to Line by Line Bible Studies. If you want, if you're looking for more studies, I've already done the whole New Testament, and uh, you can find that on oraclesofgod.org. You can download for free all kinds of hundreds of hours of, of uh, Bible studies. I also have, and also there's songs. I do scripture songs like the, well, at the beginning, the intro, that you can't really hear the song there, but that's uh, Revelation 18. <laughs> and then, um, of course, there is uh, my YouTube page, my personal one. There's some uh, a few studies there, but that's mostly for music. I just put that there. If you have a question, um, you can send your question to questions at oraclesofgod.org. And uh, during the, I don't have it up actually today because of, uh, I didn't pop the chat out. I don't even want to open the window. I'm going to just, there haven't been questions, but, and so today I'm not going to check the pop up or pop out the chat. I'm not going to check the chat because just, I've been having enough technical difficulties without trying to open up the stream while it's live and it's incredibly distracting. Because I know it's a delay. And just looking at it makes my mind start to tremble. <laughs> it's just I'm like, uh, am I interfering with this? I already have a... Um, the stream goes into the red constantly. And I just don't want to open up another window like that. So we'll just leave it be. I'll try... Usually, though, I have the, that open. And I will check the uh, chat there for questions. I'll check after the fact. <clears throat> Now all this was done, verse 22, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And I believe that's Isaiah 9. Um, I don't have my normal Bible in front of me. I do have it next to me, but I, I, it's not open. And in there I have all my references that help me remember where everything that's quoted from the Old Testament comes from. But I believe that's Isaiah 9. And, uh... No, it's not. What is it? A virgin shall conceive... I have this in a song. Unfortunately, all the songs tend to bleed together. Oh, wait. No, I'm not... Am I wrong? Wait, wait. Uh... I just want to make sure that's the right place. 
I know it's the book of Isaiah. Oh, it's seven. So there you go. Yeah, Isaiah 7, verse 14. And of course, when we studied Isaiah, I talked about how that has a, uh, of course, that had meaning for him at that time, uh, for Ahaz. Because um, his line was in doubt. People make a big point about, and so the virgin conceiving. Um, when when Isaiah wrote that, he wouldn't have thought necessarily like without a man, a virgin conceives on her wedding night, perhaps. But it has a secondary meaning, and you see this throughout the the New Testament where they liberally quote from the Old Testament uh, scriptures that at the time meant like you're going to, you know, the, the young lady will conceive. They, some will make it of the fact that uh, the word virgin in the Hebrew there does not technically mean a woman who's never been with a man, but it means a young lady. Uh, but that young or a young, you know, like, a young girl, maybe 15, 16. Certainly in that time, though, a girl of that age would be expected to be a virgin also, even if that does not technically call for a virgin. But like I said, I, I look at it as this. Is in the New Testament, what it's doing is revealing a deeper meaning to that scripture that even the prophet would not have been aware when he was inspired. Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And that's the thing is like, you know, it will mean God with us. And to them, it meant God is with us. But in the New Testament it means now God is with us, among us. I guess I thought of nine, Isaiah nine, because, oh wait, let me make this smaller. Just that, there we go. Now I can keep track of everything. Uh, Isaiah 7.14 because yeah it comes on later it says for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulders and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor the Mighty God the Everlasting Father the Prince of Peace because Isaiah went on to talk a lot more about this child and that's why I was thinking of chapter 9 The everlasting, what did it say of him? Uh, in Isaiah 9, 7, no, let's do 9, 6. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. A child is born, and his name is called the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. I've heard people dispute the Mighty God, okay? Oh, they say, well, it means um, it's Gaber, the God-man, or the man of God, or whatever. But you can't really get around the Everlasting Father when it says in Isaiah 9-6, the Everlasting Father. i got to add a little module for this program so I can bring it up in the study and you guys can see what I'm doing there. <clears throat> we'll get it. It's still the early phases of learning how to to navigate this uh, stream. So, you know, Jesus Christ is God with us. He is the representative and embodiment of God in the flesh. Um, you know, when I read there in Isaiah 9, though it's not quoted here, it's important, you know, that people, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are shown as these distinct persons in the New Testament. Yet it is not inappropriate to call Jesus Father. Because though he has a relationship with the Father, in every sense of the word, he is our Father, the Lord Jesus is. <clears throat> and he is an everlasting. You know, as God 
begot Christ, and I'm not, you know, meaning uh, in the spirit. He's the eternally begotten Son, is what they say. I mean, because he's uh, he always he eternally comes forth from the Father. I did a study called "In What Manner Is Christ Divine," and you can find that on oraclesofgod.org, my website. If you go to the studies page, and it's uh, one of the more recent studies, fairly recent, not quite though. Huh, 2017 was a big year. And Christ abolished the commandments. Hmm. I really wish I had more time to do this. Oh, it must have been much later than that. Yeah, it was fairly recent. At least compared to the other ones. That's funny. It's funny that I myself have difficulty now getting my own website. I'm like, okay, yeah. Um... It makes me, I'm like, did I actually release this study? I'm sorry, I'm like making this a terrible stream. Okay, well, uh, oh, there it is. In what, my gosh, I think it's my opaque titles or something. It's number 30. In what manner is Christ divine? Is Christ fully divine? And I explore for two hours and 22 minutes and a half minute to boot. I explore that topic and I go through just tons of relevant scriptures. Because to be divine, you know, if you ask the question, is he divine? Well, is he fully divine? Because you can have some aspect of divinity in you. But to be fully divine is the question, is he fully divine? Is he fully God? Or is he a piece of God? Is he a uh, messenger of God? You know, what is he? And that study really explores that question. But, you know, my short answer is he is fully God. Uh, that's what I believe, and that's what I believe the New Testament teaches. And you you could find examples and say, well, what about this verse, but what about that verse? Well, what about all the verses? You know, Because I always find that people have people dispute over one verse or the other. But in my study that I did, you know, number 30 on the studies page, I, I, I look at everything I can. I bring up all the things that I think uh, even contradict that and I try to deal with them because it can be a complicated question a complicated subject and I can hear people some of my detractors when I say things are complicated they're like only if you uh, make a mess of it like you do Paul it's like I could be light and trite and just blow by stuff and not take the time and care to look at it but you know uh, I, I guess I just think uh, the Bible is worth my time and attention. I, I don't know. I, I guess I think it's sort of like, it's like I, don't, I, I get the feeling like people just don't care. When they start throwing at me their interpretation, it's like you're more interested in your interpretation and what you think is the truth and you're proud about it. You know, you're, 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 you've got your identity and all your feet. You, you, you're all caught up in what you think is right and you're just trying to cram the Bible into that mold. And I'm just not on board with that. And so, it's not me that's complicating things. It's just you are oversimplifying them in order to just, you just want a shortcut to what you want to be real. I think I might detract. And, and I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in finding the real God, not just um, what I want. I wasn't a... Trinitarian. I didn't want to be one. I thought I, I, that was where I wanted to draw the line. And I don't even really, I don't go around saying I'm a Trinitarian, but my position is essentially that position. It is that position. A lot of people just don't understand what it means. And I understand. You know why they don't understand? Because it's complicated. You know, it's, um, it's not right to take a complicated issue and just... Um, I mean, I can simplify it for you, but that's where we get the mess we have today. Where people, like I used to study with Arnold Murray, and I thought I was a Trinitarian. But th what he teaches isn't the Trinity. 
three offices, right? It just isn't. It, and he calls it that. And you know, and people say, well, he does teach the Trinity. But he teaches something else and then calls that the Trinity. That's what it is. And what they mean is they've accepted the word Trinity as like the label of that's what God, God is the Trinity. You know, it's the Father, that's what you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that's the Trinity. Like when I used to say I didn't believe in the Trinity, people say, what, you don't believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? But the Trinity is not the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is a specific description of their relationship one to the other and the oneness of God. It's a reconciliation between the distinction between the persons of the Godhead, uh, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's reconciling their distinct persons with the idea that they are one God. Because like that's what the problem that's been thrown in, into our laps by the New Testament. It says there are three distinct persons based on gazillions of scriptures. And we'll get plenty of them in Matthew. I'll point out as we go along. There's a obvious distinction between the three of them, which is like brought out in visual terms. You know, the and here comes the dove and the father's voice up there. And you know, they're all separate and distinct. Yet there is one God. And so then we're like, we're, we're scratch our heads and we say, well, how do we reconcile that? And that's what the Trinity is. It's the only doctrine that actually deals with everything. And it ends up being a complicated position. It's, and so people will say, oh, it's nonsense. It doesn't make sense. It's like, well, every person you met, we meet distinct people. And they're never like one being. You know, that, that doesn't happen in our experience. But God, he's God. The idea that God could be one being and three distinct persons is highly unusual. But we don't have other examples of God. You know what I mean? Like, there's none like him. W with whom shall we compare him? W with what shall we compare him? Do, you know, the people are always like, well, the Trinity is like a uh, light bulb. I got my, uh, I like to be able to hear. It's hard to talk without a monitor. You don't feel like you have a microphone on. It's like a light bulb. A father, you know, or um, I don't know why I picked light bulb. Arnold Murray always talked about light bulb. Or they'll say, like, he's like water, solid, liquid, and gas. and uh, Or some other analogy. It's like, but you can't draw analogies between finite things in the world and an infinite God. There's no way to draw an analogy because he doesn't have any analogs in the world. There's no analog to this in the world. You know what I mean by analog? Something that is comparable. So that that drives people a little crazy because they can't compare it to anything in their experience. But that's a, a bit of vanity to think that everything that exists needs to compare to something that you've experienced. That's how people operate, though, you know. <clears throat> Like, uh, you know, the, um, like when they discovered America, when Columbus came, he thought, oh, we've reached India as planned. Because that's what they expected to be on the other side of the ocean. They didn't expect to run into another continent. But they did. There was a whole other continent. And they were like, oh, I guess this is India. You people are Indian. You know, just because that was their expectation. That's what they thought they would find, right? And that happens all the time with people. People, uh, you know, you're an you anticipate a certain result and then you interpret the evidence you find in terms of what we anticipate. You know, if we expect something to be a certain way, it kind of throws us off if it isn't. Now, if I put my keys down in a certain place and I like, okay, they're right there, and then I come back and they're not there. But for me, uh, my keys seem to magically move about because I, I'm, not, I'm not very attentive to where I put them very often. Okay. But the world is not the measure of God. It gives us some evidence of his handiwork. You know, it is an unmediated testimony of God's handiwork, as I like to say. That's my little thought. And I was put out there. It's like, you know, 
the Bible was written by some, you know, actually the book of Matthew, I mean, I can tell you right now, the names are arbitrary. You notice it didn't say, I, Matthew. They just later on attached the names of the apostles to the Gospels based on what they thought, who they thought might be behind it. But it is not obvious uh, necessarily that those, you know, so I mean, it's like they're named after the apostles. I always thought, oh, Matthew. I don't say Matthew wrote the book of Matthew, but it is written in Matthew. That's how I like to think of it, because they're, the names were assigned based on tradition, I guess you could say, and therefore it might be accurate. But don't get hung up on things like that. You know what I mean? Because like, the reason I mention that, I say, well, why do you bring all this weird stuff in here, Paul? Why do you say that Matthew might not have been written by Matthew? Because there are people who are going to say this to you. That's why I, I did that study the other day about fundamentalism. And it's this sort of stubborn belief that, like, that my pre preconceived idea of what the Bible is supposed to be is, is what the Bible is. So anything, and I used to, this these kind of thoughts, of like what, what I've been saying about Matthew, they used to just kind of scare me. And uh, and they, and people's faith get destroyed over things like, like, whoa, Matthew didn't write Matthew? Well, Matthew doesn't claim that Matthew, I mean, the book of Matthew, you read it, it never makes a claim that it was written by Matthew. You know, it's like if I told you verse 23 is not verse 23 because there are no verses in the Bible. But it's just something we've added to it, you know. But it's what I'm saying is like, don't take that too seriously. The, the, Matthew doesn't have to have written Matthew. You know, there'll be people who, apolog who are apologists who will defend the naming of the book. And that's fine. You can read that. But there are going to be other people who say, no. No, it's highly unlikely that it was written by Matthew. They chose Matthew, though, it's logical, because he would have been educated. He was a tax collector. At least uh, one might suppose. But on the other hand, you know, since tax collectors were essentially thugs um, who collected taxes for the Roman government and were kind of hated and despised, I don't think they had to necessarily keep ledgers, but they just had to, you know, they would take, they would get their money. See, they would collect taxes for the, you know, uh, for the government, but they would also get their pay from what they collected, as any collection agency does. As any, you know, um, you know, the bank when they charge fees and stuff, it's like yeah, the interest and all that. That's how they make their money. Granted, so I'm gonna get off on Matthew's the the character Matthew, how he was a tax collector at this point, but the idea that he might be educated. Though, honestly, I don't think you had to be very educated to be a tax collector in the first century. You just had to be a hard-nosed SOB. That's what you had to be. Kind of a heartless, you know, cruel a little bit. I mean, there's no friendly tax collectors. I mean, they might have a friendly outward, Hey, I'm here to collect the taxes. You ready to give your taxes? You know, there's, but there's no... <laughs> I mean... There's nothing really nice about it, though they may appear nice. So, um, so my point about the the Matthew, um, what I'm saying is, be prepared. People are going to come at your faith from weird angles. They try to, um, and and this thing, if we have the the idea that the Bible is, um, if we don't know about the the sort of the warts that are on the surface of it, like where people have investigated certain things and, and sort of realized that like well the the names were assigned later you know that the earliest things aren't going to have we have Matthew from very early but we don't have the title on it that was assigned later by people who were living sometime later and they thought well uh, Matthew Mark Luke so it's done somewhat traditionally and therefore take it with a grain of salt that's all and don't let someone come along and just rip you or, you know like blow your mind with a suggestion and it because the thing is it's one thing if someone just comes to you but then like you get into research and stuff and there's a lot of books and people talking and they will say things to try to tear down the scriptures but if you think about it they're never really tearing anything down except superficial things 
like uh, like well who wrote this and blah 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 and and the, and the, this book appeared at this time and all that but as far as the contents as far as the teaching the doctrine and the power of god they can't touch that and i, I admit that it that my experience with the holy spirit is what immunized me and finally made me able to confront all these things without fear because i used to be somewhat afraid there were books i remember hearing people talking like feeling this like oh dizzy like i don't know if i can handle this because it's going to erode my faith i can feel it, it like saying like you know the things you believe they're not true or what you know what i mean but i was it was my faith in my fundamentalist view that was being eroded not my faith in really anything taught in the bible or in the idea that god has inspired these things and uh and so god's power eventually enabled by him by continuing to seek him and by him giving me my own sort of personal evidence that enabled me to just look at this and be like well so what yeah it's no different than them adding the verse numbers they added a title it's a good title the book of Matthew I love it <laughs> Hmm. Let's do the last verse. We're at 8 o'clock. It's time to finish, but we're good. All right. God is with us in the person of Jesus. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took, him to, uh, took, took unto him his wife. And he knew her not. Why am I inserting words? And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. Very simple, very straightforward. And we did a whole chapter in an hour. Great. Um, so he was obedient to the dream. And thus, Jesus was not born illegitimate. Because you know, he was, you know, he was going to put her away. And now she'd be a uh, unwed mother. Which in that time was a disaster for her. I mean, it's not much better than him... Uh, having her stoned but you know he, he I mean you know what I'm saying like he, he was not willing to just have her killed what a horrible thing but you know I don't he didn't want to raise someone else's baby and she'd done something very in his mind you know I mean in first impression she'd done something uh, she'd done him a great disservice uh, she'd sinned against him greatly if that was if it was as appeared and so why should he have to live with that, you know, um, you know, why should he be forced to support her forever because she's been, you know, unfaithful? And so he was minded to put her away, but the angel of the Lord prevents it and prevents Jesus from having to be raised by a single mother in the first century, which is not, which is a non-starter. That's a, the doorway to absolute poverty. Uh, there's no like, well, she could go to work at the local uh, gas station and send the baby to daycare or whatever there's no uh you know she goes and you know uh her whole family would be against her there'd just be so many bad things that would uh make it very difficult for her to survive and he knew her not till she brought forth her firstborn son till you know it's not can't suggest that after the son was born that he knew her and there are people in the gospel, uh, I, don't remember, I don't know if they'll appear, yeah, his brethren will be in this gospel, they always are. They're, they're referred to as his brothers. You know, and not just like, and he even says, he draws a line and compares like to his disciples. He says, these are my brethren. Meaning that the the thought that oh well those aren't really his brothers it's just you know they're his brothers like like we call each other their brothers and even though we're not but he draws a distinct line by saying you know when they said your mother and your brethren are without he says who is my mother who is my brother these my disciples these are my brethren and my mother and my father and not my father <laughs> my mother and my brethren these are my family essentially so that concludes chapter one that concludes our first study in matthew i'm looking forward to getting really into it 
fast, moving forward quickly to get to the cool parts. I mean, not that there's nothing cool about this, but I le really enjoy teaching parables. And it's been a while since I did Matthew, and I very frequently hear from people that that's the first thing they go to when they study with me. So it'll be nice to have a new version of that because there are definitely deficiencies with the original. It was uh, recorded like 10 years ago, around 9, 8, something like that. I don't remember if I put dates on all those old studies anymore. But I know I started them in 2009. Okay, so this has been Line by Line Bible Studies. My name is Paul Stringini. Thank you for joining me in this study. I look forward to studying with you again tomorrow.